Oh, now today's message starts with something very special. I've got something very important to me. This is my favorite jacket. Now, some of you may have seen me wear it. In winter, I often wear this to church. It's, it's, it's special, right? It's, it's black, like all good jackets should be. It's got a hoodie. I mean, what leather jackets have hoodies? This is a new thing. Now, I must confess, though, I didn't want to buy it. My wife made me buy it um, when we were shopping some years ago. And I'm glad she made me buy it. She does have some good ideas. Yeah, sometimes she's right. Yeah, you probably can't hear her. Um, this is my favorite jacket, and I love it to bits. Now, there is no way on God's earth I would take this jacket and I would lay it on the ground and walk across it. Socks, undies, shirts, jeans, that's a different story as my wife would attest, but not my favorite jacket. Now, there's no way on God's earth I would lay it down on the ground and allow someone to ride their donkey across it. It's just not going to happen. I mean, seriously. But friends, that's just exactly what we see happen with Jesus today, right? We see, him, we see people lay down their cloaks on the ground and Jesus ride across them on a donkey. Now for them, their cloaks, their jackets, it's their most life-giving, it's most precious. It's an identity-making possession. Right? That's how important their jackets are. And that's how significant this act of laying it down is. Now these jackets were, these cloaks were precious and expensive. Most people could only afford one. And this is important historical facts here. And these jackets, these cloaks were identity making. You could tell a person's profession by the kind of cloak they wore. You could tell if they were rich or if they're poor, their, their social status by the kind of cloak they wore. And their cloaks were life-giving, literally life-giving. They would, they would use them when they traveled from village to village. Remember, they're on foot, they're walking, and most journeys go overnight. So this cloak, it would keep them warm in those freezing desert nights. And they're metaphorically life-giving too. I mean, we see this identity. We see even Jesus' identity wrapped up in the cloak that he wore as a woman was healed by simply touching his cloak. That's just how important they were. Now, for a brief moment, Jesus is important enough to re is important enough to receive this kind of respect from an entire city who laid down their most precious possession for Jesus to ride across on his donkey. It's pretty amazing. Well, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to share this short story of, of, of this event recorded in the scriptures. It's Jesus' five minutes of fame, if you will. And then I'm going to talk about what it could mean for us today. All right, let me pray first. Loving God, please open our hearts. Please open our minds to your word and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 21 verse 1 says this. Once you were not a people. Well, that's the wrong one. Pardon me. Matthew 21 verse 1 says this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. It seems to me that Jesus in his five minutes of fame could just get anything he wanted, right? He could get whatever he asked for. I mean, these, these people had seen these disciples who were responding to Jesus' command. They'd seen him walk on water, calm storms, feed 5,000. And these crowds had seen his miracles too. And more importantly, they'd heard his teachings. Teachings like, do to others as you would have them do to you. Turn the other cheek. Words that are not human wisdom. They're not merely the words of man. And, and this is important. They'd seen his miracles. And on this day, they truly believed that Jesus was a great warrior king. He was the king that would have been prophesied about for over a thousand years. A king that would set them free from their oppression, from, from being locked down and restricted. Of course, Jesus does exactly that. 
And he does it not just for them, not just for first century Jerusalem, but he does it for all people, for all time. Now, I just want us to put a pin in that for a moment because I'm going to come back to it. But first, I want us to read on. We're going to read on in this Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read on to verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. See what I mean? Off they go. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. It's no exaggeration when the Bible says a very large crowd, right? It's no exaggeration. See, this was Passover. This was a great feast, the greatest feast of their region in their time. It was a celebration of God setting his people free from slavery in Egypt. Now, this crowd, they didn't just lay down their most precious possession for Jesus to ride over. They also followed him and they went ahead of him, shouting out. This is what they're shouting out. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, Alison and myself, our first day in church, apart from the day we got married, right? Our first day in church was Palm Sunday. And we didn't know this. We, we didn't realize that's what was, was going on. But we rocked up at the church and people are all gathered out around side. And they're all holding palm branches like the one behind me. And they're all and they're waving them. And they've got a, a musician with a trumpet as they would march around. And then we all marched around the church and the block. And then in we went. Now, you think this event would turn us off, wouldn't you? You think it'd be a bit like, wow, what's going on here? But it didn't. We saw that this was important to these people by what was going on. And it kind of drew us into the community as the crowd cried out, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna means save us, we pray. If you didn't realize it, when they say Hosanna, they mean save us, we pray. In other words, they're saying this. Jesus, save us, we pray. You are the son of David. Remember David who who slayed Goliath? You are the son of David, our most revered king of all time. Jesus, save us, we pray. In the name of the Lord and in the highest heaven. Jesus, save us, we pray. Of course, they did not fully understand the significance of this event, right? They didn't fully understand it, the significance of of this event or their words for that matter. But even still, they praised Jesus, didn't they? In their moment of trouble, when they were still under the oppression of the Romans, they still praised Jesus. They welcomed him and they bestowed great honor upon him. Why? Well, I think we have at least three reasons for this. Firstly, they had seen Jesus' miracles. Much, many of this crowd, some of them would have been there when he fed 5,000 plus people. They'd seen it. They'd heard his teachings for themselves. And they knew that this man on a donkey was more than a man. Well, second thing, they trusted. They trusted their friends. They had faith, if you will. They had faith in those who had seen and heard Jesus, who Jesus had impacted their lives, changed their lives. They'd seen these people acting differently because of their interaction with Jesus. And they had faith that Jesus was who they said he was. And thirdly, I think this is the one that, that, that may speak to us today too. And, and I think they were desperate. I actually think they were, they were desperate. See, these people were suffering. They were suffering. They were restricted. They were confined. They weren't able to do the things they wanted to do. And they expected that a good God, that a loving God, that a powerful God would set them free. You'll see what I mean as we continue into verse 10 of Matthew 21. It says this. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, the whole city, who is this? Great question. 
The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. For, the, for those in the crowd, this is a huge statement. This is a recognition that Jesus is who he says he is. But friends, the, friends, brothers and sisters, their response to the coming Messiah, right? It's, it's actually not what's important. What's important today is our response. What's your response to this man riding a donkey, being treated with such great honor and respect? Remember I said that Jesus came to save? He came to save not just the crowds. The crowds here that would soon turn against him. They will stop crying out, Hosanna, save us, we pray. And they will instead be crying out, crucify, crucify him. No, Jesus came to save all people for all time. Now, most of us have heard this Christian claim before. We may have heard it many times, that Jesus saves us. But what does it mean? I mean, what do we need saving from? Surely we have everything we need. Surely science has all the answers. Save us, we pray. Perhaps it was the drought. Save us. But that's, that's finished now. For the most part, we've seen rain across the country. It's done. Perhaps it's the bushfires. We saw on television many people praying exactly that, that there'd be an end to this terrible time. But the fires are out. For many, it's just a memory. Some are still dealing with the pain of that event, but for most, it is now just a thing of the past. Save us. What about the coronavirus? I can't very well not speak about that today considering where we are all at and why we are there and why I'm even broadcasting. Perhaps it's save us, we pray, from the coronavirus. But you know what? At some point in the near future, this will be a thing of the past. This will be like every great depression. It'll be something our grandparents, we the grandparents, talk about. <laughs> you know, growing up, we used to pick on my nana. Should show respect to your elders, I know. We used to jest. I mean, it's an Australian thing, right? We used to kind of jest. We used to pick on my nana. Because you know what? Her pantry was always full of pasta. It was always full of rice. And her cupboard in the hallway was always packed to the top with, you guessed it, toilet paper. See, she had lived through the Depression. She knew what it was like to go without. We never took her seriously. We, we never listened. <laughs> but if Jesus doesn't save us from fire, flood, or famine, sorry, pandemic didn't rhyme. You know, I love to rhyme. If you know me, you know I love to rhyme, but I couldn't this time. So I just had to go with fire, flood, or famine. But you know what I mean, right? Jesus saves us from something far greater, far more serious, something that is the source, something that's the heart of all of this stuff. Even what we see in the droughts and the floods and the fires, even as creation groans itself, he saves us from that. He saves us from the source of anxiety. He saves us from the source of frustration, arguments, abuse, Domestic violence. He even saves us from the source of hate. The crowd wanted someone to save them from their present problem. The crowd wanted someone to save them from their current predicament. But Jesus, he saved them from so much more. He saved them from the problem. And my friends, my brothers and sisters, the problem is not the fire, the floods. The pandemic. The problem is my sin and your sin. Now stick with me for a minute. It's the stuff that's beneath us. We know it's beneath us, yet we keep doing it. It's the stuff that's beneath us that we can't put behind us. 
unless we have faith and trust in Christ. He helps us put what's... He enables us. It's more than help. It's a hope. It's a guarantee. It's a confident expectation. He enables us to put behind us what is beneath us. That's what Jesus came to save us from. Now, Easter is just one week away. And as Easter approaches, let me encourage you. Let me encourage each of us to stop being like the teenager who covers up their pimples with lotions and creams when all they need to do is change their diet. Let me encourage you, stop being like the teenager, covering stuff up with creams and lotions when what they need to do is change their diet. And my friends, our diet of sin needs to change. And Christ is the one who can do that with us, in us, and for us. There's no better time than Easter to seek Him. Who is this? They cried out. I'm almost done. Who is this? They cried out. Who is this? Some say he's a wise teacher. Some say he never walked the earth. No legitimate historian would agree with that. But so many say that he is the son of the living God. He is the one who can help us, enable us, equip us to put behind us what's beneath us. And once we do that, everything changes. We're going to be back Friday for our Easter Good Friday service. Be more is going to come out about what's going to involve, and we're going to be back on Easter Sunday as well. Who is this? That's the question for today. Well, let me pray and then I'll introduce our next song. Lord, thank you so much. Father God, you sent Jesus to save us from the source of all our trouble, the source of all pain and suffering. Lord, help us to speak it with our lips, to believe in our heart that you raised Jesus from the dead and saved us from our sin. Lord, we pray you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.